Hi, my name is Stefan from Lyon. I'm an architect and artist from Cape Town. Most recently, I completed the Master of Architecture 2 program at the Cooper Union in New York City. Professor Diana Grace really challenged us to dismantle our assumptions and to try and reveal through drawing and through narrative concepts the hidden forces that shape, um, that shape our relationships to cities. I think uh, by learning to, tr to think about architecture from without, through observation and participation in powerful, natural, and urban phenomena, it may become possible to think about building in a world where fixity has washed away. I'm going to show you two projects, um, both set in Cape Town, both using drawing as a means to reveal the invisible. The first project is called The Ghost Ship, and this was my thesis at the University of Cape Town in 2010. Um, the project is located at KL Birth, just a stone's throw away from where we're sitting in Cape Town's harbor. And this site used to be in, this indicated in, in white. So this site used to be an anonymous point in open water. It was reclaimed during the 1930s. And this idea of transformation, changing from one state to the next, from water into land, became the guiding light of this, of this project. I started to think about ways of drawing that, that would complement my, my ideas about the site. So these are models that I assembled from various pieces of old models and bits and pieces that I found in scrapyards in Cape Town. And the idea was to then draw these models, transforming the shapes, almost absorbing those shapes in the paper to transform into something new. This is the first site model that I made of my project, also assembled in a, in a similar fashion to the, the scrap models previously. And the ghost ship is a building machine that would allow the site to be returned to the ocean over the course of 200 years. So the fins on the left-hand side, um, that's a seawall manifold, which allows water back onto the site. And on the other side is a flood landscape. So each day, this machine, or this building machine, would undergo more convincing flood, um, flood tests in anticipation of the site's inevitable seizure um, by the water. This is a section through the building. On the left is the seawall manifold, and the big space in the middle, that is the hole. So a single visitor would have the opportunity to walk, walk up, sit in the chair, and listen to the wind beat on this very rickety veil around the space. So like, like the site, um, I thought it would be inappropriate to build something permanent on it. So this building, or this, this ghost ship, horn scale berth, its existence is a function of risk and patience. The second project was my thesis at the Cooper Union, um, which I called Military Urbanism. This project really represents my attempt to try and unearth the unconscious of Cape Town's urban divisions. The scars of apartheid-era social engineering are poignant reminders of Cape Town's troubled past, and with the enactment of the Group Areas Act in the 1950s, the city was carved into racially segregated sectors um, and cut in the image of a nationalist government. So on the left is a drawing of an ideal apartheid city as, as a model, showing infrastructure and industrial areas buffering the group areas. On the right is a drawing that I had made to try and look for this model within the fabric of Cape Town itself, with the Cape Flats area um, indicated in black. I think um, apartheid was actually no isolated project. Um, long before the ball bulldozers hit the soil, the lines dividing Cape Townians from the elements and from one another were drawn in the sand. The impetus for, for this project really was the idea that the city's fractured character is rooted as much in the soil and the landscape itself as it is in social dynamics. Some of the earliest human settlements actually lived within sight of, of Cable, uh, Cape Town's Table Mountain. And through colonial land appropriation, the nomadic Khoi tribe um, was displaced, uh, eroding an animistic connection to the landscape. Landscape was instead turned into a weapon and implicated in an incipient tradition of um, ethnic and economical marginalization. So on the left, the, the bright green shows the Nostrfeld, which is actually the most nutrient-rich soils associated with the mountains and the, the hill areas, which I just blotted out in, in white. On the right-hand side is the, 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 the Khoi's um, annual se seasonal transhumance route, which would follow the soil and would follow the water. This drawing shows uh, Dutch agricultural expansion within the first few decades of settlement. With each new advance, um, the, the Khoi's transhumance pattern was pushed back and displaced further back into the hinterland. This drawing shows um, the establishment of the first Dutch farms in the Leesburg Valley just around 
Table Mountain. The thick green line indicates a hedge that the, the, the Dutch had built to um, exclude the Koi from what is now known as the, the Cape Town City Bowl, the area in which we're sitting now, effectively rendering this their summer pasture um, non-existent. This drawing shows the first hundred years of, of Dutch agricultural expansion in the Cape Colony, um, with the spectre of the Koi's movement route put over that. So I think that initial movement route is quite a good indication of where the good soil is, and hence it fits neatly on top. The British Empire inherited a fortified city from, from the Dutch East Indian Company. This drawing on the right-hand side shows how Table Mountain and how the landscape itself was used as part of the city's fortifications. During the 1830s, slavery was abolished, and it was necessary to try and create, find new ways of creating and working on the class. This drawing shows the use of prison chain gangs to stitch, stitch together a divided settlement by building roads. This is in the mid-19th century. Um, the areas, the two wings in red, indicated are districts one and six. And during the mid-19th century, um, single property owners bought out whole streets. So next to these areas, um, new prisons were established and also new sites of work. Um, in the 1860s, when it was possible for the property owners to m move out of these areas, it was replaced by working popu population um, adjacent to uh, where the New York docks were built. In 1901, the plague breaks out, and it shows in these working areas, poignantly, which buildings are affected, located in, in these slums. So the black and the colored population were rounded up at Ebenezer Street and at the station before being shipped out to what is actually the first segregated township in the Bernie, just across the Lisbeck River, setting the turn, I think, for the rest of the 20th century's urban development in Cape Town. Thank you for your attention.